Good evening. I'm Diane Sayre. I'm a LaRouche Independent Candidate for U.S. Senate, and this is the Friday Symposium that I'm hosting to take up various issues uh, around the state of New York and the nation since I am running for federal office. As people know, the question of nuclear power has been a major topic of these discussions, and it's a very urgent one. Uh, and before I introduce my speakers this evening, let me just tell you that uh, Mrs. LaRouche just addressed the annual Moscow Academic Economic Forum, uh, which is called Global Transformation of Modern Societies and the National Development Goals of Russia. And she began by talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and the discrepancy between the way nations dealt with it some, of it, some of them very, very effectively and others not. Obviously, one major factor in how nations are able to cope with the pandemic is their economy. Do people have clean drinking water? Do they have electricity? Do they have adequate sanitation, housing, uh, actual health care facilities? The situation in India, which has been very hard hit, they were estimating 4,000 deaths per day, excepting they were only counting people who died in hospitals. And when you account for the fact that about two thirds of the population of India, that is 700 to 900 million people are in rural areas, it was estimated that the death rates there could be up to 20,000 people per day. So imagine what that means for civilization. Uh, she then discussed, and it's amazing what she was able to get into a very short speech, the hyperinflation where the increase of money supply has been 75% this year. Now we don't quite have 75% inflation, but we're getting there. Anyone who's been interested in building a house or building anything lately has seen a dramatic increase in the cost of commodities. We're seeing an increase in the cost of petroleum and many other things, uh, but we don't have a commensurate increase in productivity. That's why it's inflationary because our dollars are being used to bail out fictitious gambling debts, which really are inherently worthless and it's devaluing our currency. And you have people moving to really crazy policies uh, like in Europe, I forget the term for it, but they're saying that they wanna build buildings only out of wood and bamboo. No more concrete, no more steel. It sounds like a terrible fire hazard. I don't know how tall the buildings are gonna be able to be. I don't know how sturdy they'll be if you go far underground. Um, and if they're so concerned about the environment, why do they wanna use wood? That seems to be a little bit counterintuitive. So a lot of backwardness. And finally, she says, with his science of physical economy, Lyndon LaRouche developed the yardstick needed by defining the correlation of the energy flux density. That is not only energy per capita, but energy per given area um, used in the production process and the associated relative potential population density, which can be maintained on each level. Since wind and solar have very low energy flux densities, and many countries such as Germany are exiting nuclear energy, the Great Reset threatens to lead to a population reduction of billions, which is the result desired by the neo-Malthusian advocates of green finance. The Green New Deal is the opposite of the New Deal of Franklin D. Roosevelt. It is the revival of the economics of Yalmar Schacht with the same results, mass death and war. So I think it's extremely powerful that she was able to make this speech to a very high level gathering of Russian policymakers, academics, diplomats and others, because we really wanna put this fight for energy in the proper terms. Now, with that being said, uh, before I introduce my speakers, let me say, as I always do, and it's in the material you've received about this forum, Participation in the SARE for Senate Symposium does not constitute endorsement of my campaign. Um, it also does not mean that I necessarily agree or endorse the views of my speakers and they may not endorse my views, although clearly we have certain strong areas of agreement. 
the point of this is to have the dialogue and discussion of very important topics that have really life and death implications for people. So that being said, I would like to introduce our first guest who is Herschel Spector, who is a professional engineer with over 50 years experience in the electric power industry. He's a graduate of MIT, uh, worked with the Army and had a career in physics, thermal hydraulics, and heat transfer. And I didn't know uh, that you were with the Atomic Energy Commission. And that was your function at Indian Point, the AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, licensing manager for Indian Point 3. The safety report, the safety review. So this is a person who has great personal knowledge of the situation with Indian Point specifically and nuclear power more broadly. So with that, go ahead, Mr. Spector. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I do have a lot of experience. Sometimes I have to guard myself not to get a little bitter about what's actually happening, but I've always been an optimist and I remain so. However, what I wanted to do tonight was kind of very different and to deal with environmentalism, particularly here in New York, and I am going to claim tonight that environmentalism in New York has died. That's a pretty strong statement, but let me say that up to now there's been a lot of battle, shall we say, between people who do not believe that uh, human activity uh, affects the climate and others, particularly in the environmental community, which says that human activity is driving climate change. And that battle uh, goes on. However, it's my view that the battle has already been lost and been lost by the environmentalists and they've lost it because of their own actions here in New York. Pretty strong statement. Well, let's go back to the closure of Indian Point 3, which happened a short time ago on April 30th of this year. The very same day that uh, Indian Point 3 closed, was the end of a world's record by that nuclear plant. It had operated a total of 750 days continuously, breaking all previous records. It's an ironic thing that you should close down on the very day that you bring a world beater and establishing a new record. The nuclear plant, uh, Indian Point 3, and its sister plant, Indian Point 2, for those that don't know it, was actually responsible for about 80% of the clean electricity. That means no carbon releases. Clean electricity in New York State's uh, lower areas, essentially from Albany South. So it was a great contributor in an environmental sense. And now it is shut down. Both units could have operated for decades more and further, uh, these same two units has supplied New York City, all of New York City and Westchester County with about 25% of its electricity. So they were among the largest uh, electric plants in the state of New York, a very high reliability and carbon free. So both units, as I said, were capable of uh, several decades more operation. And contrary to the commitments made by our governor, Governor Andrew Cuomo, to only replace Indian Point with carbon-free electricity sources, both units, this has not happened. Both have been replaced by gas, a fossil fuel. So at which point we now have a huge conflict in the state of New York, where on one hand we are saying that we are a uh, leader in dealing with climate change. And on the other hand, we're replacing the biggest source of carbon-free electricity with gas, a conflict. Now, a little history is helpful. First of all, the very night that Indian Point 3 was shut down after its long run, and not just the 750 days, but decades of good, safe, no one has ever been hurt by running uh, Indian Point two or three. The, that very night, Riverkeeper, 
the National Resources Defense Council and the Sierra Club had a celebration. They were celebrating the closure of this fossil free, carbon free nuclear power plant. To me, it's vulgar when you dance on other people's graves, but it's insane if you dance on your own grave. And that's exactly what they have done, whether wittingly or unwittingly. Let me talk to you about the, the impact of, in an environmental way of replacing Indian Point with gas, huge amounts of gas. A colleague of mine and I did a little calculation, very simple. We looked at uh, offshore wind power for New York. Uh, mind you, that's a very big deal in New York. When it was first announced by Governor Cuomo, he was talking about 2,400 megawatts of offshore wind power and claimed that this would be the world's largest offshore wind power source. Since then, they bumped it up to 9,000 megawatts. So if 2,400 megawatts was the world's largest, I guess I have to suppose that 9,000 megawatts must be the largest in the whole galaxy. In any case, look at the benefits of the offshore wind. The purpose of the offshore wind is basically to uh, replace uh, the greenhouse gases that are released by the gas plants. Fine. And as the plants uh, off, excuse me, as the wind turbines are built offshore, more and more gas will be displaced. So let's add it up year after year after year. But simultaneously, let's add up the gases, the greenhouse gases being released by the two, by the replacement gas plants for Indian Point. And so here's the offshore stuff. Here's the gas plants at Indian Point. Bam. They finally equalize. It takes until around the year 2040 for that huge offshore wind power, wind farm to catch up with the uh, gas releases from Indian Point. Well, for the environmental community, which fears that the, uh, we only have maybe 10 or 12 years to really get going on dealing with climate change, 2040 just to start to make improvements is far too late. So in a sense, the replacement of Indian Point with gas completely destroys one of the main uh, ways in which New York State hopes to deal with climate change. So this state and those that support what's going on are have an internal conflict which they have not dealt with. But how did this happen that if replacing Indian Point with so much uh, gas is so detrimental to the environmental movement. Why did the environmental movement or even the state of New York permit this? To get that answer, you have to go back many years and realize that in order to do something as huge as shutting down the Indian Point plants, you had to scare a lot of people into believing what you're saying. You had to make it a frightening possibility. And that was very successfully done. The way it was done was to say that, well, you know, you have to evacuate out to 50 miles if there's an accident at Indian Point. But there's 20 million people within 50 miles. You can't do that. Therefore, you must close the plant down. A very similar tactic was done years earlier on Long Island with Shoreham. Oh, you can't evacuate the high population density around Shoreham. And guess what? Shoreham was shut down. And in both cases, for Shoreham and also for Indian Point, replaced by gas. Now, I've served as a chairman of two emergency planning national committees. I've been a guest lecturer at Harvard's prestigious School of Public Health on emergency planning. And the 50 mile business is pure nonsense. There is a 50 mile zone around each nuclear power plant, but that has nothing to do with evacuation or sheltering. It has to do with preventing people consuming possible contaminated food or, or even contaminated water. Very unlikely, but possible. 
What the people in opposition to Indian Point did is they purposely mixed up the 10 mile emergency planning zone where people might take shelter or evacuate with the 50 mile zone, which has nothing to do with evacuation or sheltering. It's food interdiction. And they scared a lot of people and a lot of very senior people within the state of New York and within the environmental community repeated this fiction over and over and over. All the meetings you go to with regard to Indian Point, the issue keeps coming up. And in any case, the scare tactic, the fiction was extremely effective. In any case, it, the problem is, is that now uh, a lot of the environmental group is trapped by their own statements. For example, if you look at the history in New York State of the buildup of renewable energy, it's been very slow, very, and continues to be very slow. But if you look at the history of the buildup of gas in New York State, it completely, but completely outstrips the uh, growth of renewable energy. The bottom line is that New York State talks renewable, but does gas. And it's so extreme that in this year in 2021, the amount of renewable energy in 2021 is still smaller than the amount of gas that was used back in New York in 2004. It's a long time ago. So in any case, what we have is a situation now that so many falsehoods and misleading statements have been made while in the meantime, there's been a huge buildup of the fossil fuel industry that these environmental groups, which are dancing on their own graves, have nowhere to go. They have trapped themselves. They don't have to be in a fight with people who believe or don't believe in the impact of uh, human actions on uh, greenhouse gases and climate change. They've done it to themselves. That's, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, I think Mark Nelson has still not been able to get here. So what I'm going to do is introduce Megan DeBroat, who is the president of the Schiller Institute in the United States and was a longtime collaborator of Lyndon LaRouche and his science team. And I think she's gonna take up some of these fundamental questions, but she told me in a very quick way. So we'll probably hopefully have more questions after she's done than answers. So go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Diane. So I want to address the question of economics, but I want to start with the, the idea, which is absolutely pervasive, that human beings should, that, that we have, as human beings, we have to have as little impact on the environment as possible. That human activity is inherently bad. And you get this in schools, you get this from your bank statement, you get this everywhere. The idea that human beings are encroaching upon nature, we're, we're strangling the biosphere, and therefore we have to cut back. We have to reduce our carbon or our footprint, right? Our carbon footprint, our footprint, and not upset the balance of nature. In other words, it were better if we can make it as if we were never here. Now, I know not everyone believes that, but that's that's really what underlies this, this view that's being pushed. And what I want to say is that scientifically, economically, that is actually the most unnatural, unscientific concept that I can think of. I mean, not even the biosphere lives within the so-called balance of nature, but more so if human society were to adopt those axioms and carry them out, that would lead to the economic collapse of civilization. Now, take this very pervasive related idea that human population growth is bad. You know, the idea, oh, isn't it terrible? We have almost 8 billion people on the planet. It's going to be 20 billion people quite soon. Um, that's too much too much, right? We're all gonna exhale, our industries are gonna pollute everything and we're just gonna destroy the biosphere. Now, Lyndon LaRouche 
who was the most successful economic forecaster of the 20th century and the early 21st century, he gave a speech in 1988. And in that speech, he said that if we made use of the technologies that were available to us at the end of the 1960s, and if we applied those to uplift the standard of living in every nation across the globe, this planet could easily support a potential population of 100 billion people living longer, healthier, happier, more productive lives than we enjoy today. How could he make such a statement? If we were to do that, wouldn't that mean that the human population would start to consume resources at an incredible accelerating rate? Yeah, it would. It would. But what you find from a study of physical economics, uh, a science which Lyndon LaRouche didn't uh, found, it was founded by Leibniz, but LaRouche contributed fundamental breakthroughs, is that that increase in the consumption of what we call natural resources, raw material resources, is a necessary feature of the progress of human economic progress and the development of the biosphere and the planet itself. Now, we know that because of what LaRouche discovered, that the metric of actual, uh, the metric of physical economics is not monetary, not um, this kind of monetary um, fictional, fictitious value that you get from the Wall Street and other gamblers who are ruining the financial system today. But what I want to focus on, since we have limited time, I want to focus on one feature of this economic process, which is really key, really central, and that's the concept of energy flux density. So energy flux density, what we mean is we mean the concentration of energy throughput over a given area, whether that area is um, a piece of metal, a piece of steel that you're cutting with a machine tool, or whether that air, we're talking about the concentration of energy distributed over a certain sector of territory. Um, so with energy flux density, you're looking at the concentration of power and the consequent work that that allows us to achieve and to accomplish. So with higher and higher concentrations of energy throughput, energy flux density, what we find is that our ability to cause change, to accomplish work and to support more and more people at a higher standard of living is increased. Now, a simple illustration of energy flux density to start to get a little bit specific, one pedagogy Mr. LaRouche gives in his economics textbook is that of a simple machine, a knife. So you can imagine if I had two knives and I applied the same force to the handle of each of those knives. Now, one of them is very dull and one of them is very sharp. Which one would accomplish more work? Well, the sharp one, but why? The force that I'm applying to the handle in the sharp knife is concentrated in the very, very um, thin portion of the blade and allows me to accomplish more work with the same or actually probably less effort than I need to apply to the dull knife. Now let's take another example. Let's take the example, I'm gonna share my screen here. Let's take the example of machining. So what this is, this is a piece of stainless steel which has been magnified to um, the little black bar on the bottom, that's 50 micrometers. Um, so on the left, you have a piece of stainless steel cut with uh, you know, a, a metal blade. And on the right, you have a piece of stainless steel cut with a conventional laser cutter. Now you notice the difference in precision that you, that you get when you go to the laser cutting tool. The concentration of the energy and related to that, the temperature that we achieve with the laser cutter allows us to accomplish the same work faster and much more precisely. Now we see a similar effect, um, if I can 
move my slide, there we go, we see a similar effect in the difference between a conventional laser cutter and a petawatt laser cutter. So on the left, you see a piece of stainless steel, which is cut, and then also on the top, it's a pulse delivered or um, delivered into the stainless steel with the conventional laser. Now, I don't know about this one, but maybe let's say it's, um, you know, something like 500 watts. And then on the right, you have the petawatt laser, which is 10 to the 15th watts. Look at the difference. Think back to the difference between the conventional laser and the mechanical metal blade cutting that stainless steel. And on the right with the petawatt laser, we have zero deformation of the metal because the energy is deposited faster at, in a smaller time scale than um, it's deposited more quickly than the heat would be able to disperse and deform the surrounding material. So what we find, there we go. Um, what we find is that with increased energy flux density, with this increase of the concentration of power applied at the point of production, we can accomplish more work, better work, and different work with the same or overall less effort. Now, I wanna look at another example of energy flux density in a slightly different manifestation. So here you see, this is the United States energy flux density. So this is the power per capita uh, in the United States beginning in 1780 and going up to 2010. Um, so what this is, so we're not just talking about how much household energy use, you know, how much electric, how much your electricity bill says you use that month. But we're, what we're talking about is take the total power of the nation involved in industries, infrastructure, household use, agriculture, all sources divided by the number of people at that time. So the first thing you should notice is that it goes up over time meaning that each person in the country in energy terms or in power terms is more expensive than we were in the past. Now, why? Well, think about it. The, think about the transformation since the 18th century in farming technology, in industries, in the development of our continent, in um, railroads, hospitals, all of these things which actually require power. Now, this increase in uh, cost of each human being has been correlated with a rising standard of living, rising life expectancy, the general conditions of life, especially if you look around, around the turn of the 20th century, maybe a little bit later, it really starts to take off as you have the electric motor, electrification, and so forth spread across the country. So you'll notice a couple more things about this chart. So first, you probably notice the different colors that yes, there's an overall rise in energy flux density across the, the country, but there's also a change over in primary fuel source. So I wanna look, so and you see we, the primary fuel source was wood and then it progressed to coal and then primarily now oil and natural gas. And then just a little bit in the middle of the 20th century, just a little bit of nuclear power with this little red sliver. Um, but I want to look at that a little more closely. So here you see a table, which is exactly what it says. How much fuel would it take to meet New York City's electri electricity requirements for one year divided by fuel source? So this is based on 2015 um, electricity requirements. So if we provided those using wood, it would take 16 million tons of wood. If we provided it with coal, half that, 8 million. Petroleum, 5 million. And here's, here, here's the, the kicker here. Nuclear power, if we go to uranium as the, as the fuel source, 55 tons. That's 1 300,000th. <laughs> of what it would take with wood. And then we move on to fusion. 
deuterium tritium fuel, less than one ton of fusion fuel to power New York City for a year. And then even projections for matter, antimatter. So that's just a little hint, a little clue about the fact that it's not just different resources we happen to find in the ground. You're looking at a progression over time in mankind's power over nature. And with these, with this series of fuels, what we find is they also give human beings, not, o- not only does it take less labor to provide the necessary power for the nation, but it also gives, each successive fuel source gives human society access to higher and higher temperatures of power applied, which allows us to do really amazing things like what we will eventually be able to do with fusion where we could turn virtually any material into a plasma and separate it out into its constituent elements and mine the materials we need. But what is this changeover dependent upon? And this is really the secret to economics. Where, you know, why, you know, why didn't the, the original American revolutionaries, the 18th century Americans use uranium if it's such a great fuel source? Well, the discovery of nuclear chemistry hadn't happened yet. They couldn't have. To them, it was a, a uranium ore was a rock if they even found it, right? So the availability, the ability to unlock the power of these resources has depended upon a, ser- a sequence, a series of discoveries of principles of the universe, something which only the human mind can do. And so in that, you start to get a peek, a hint about the nature and the role and the, the, the sanctity of every human life. Think back to those 100 million people LaRouche was saying we could be supporting. Um, now, I said you, you would notice two things about that chart. Just quickly, I'll point out the second. Oops, oops, I think I have to cycle through again. Oh no. Okay, pardon me, I'm gonna fix my chart and then I'll, I'll share it again. Okay. So the second thing you'll notice is that it levels off the, what had been a rise, an accelerating rise in kilowatts per capita around 1975 completely flattens out and has actually gone down in the recent couple, well, this is 2010, starting at around 2008, 2006. Now what you see kind of faintly um, here continuing this, oh gosh, what what you saw, I'm not gonna bother with that again, but what you saw um, continuing that exponential curve, those were projections from the Kennedy administration of where we should have been by now in terms of power available per capita in the country. So why is that important? Why has, does that have to be something we're absolutely determined to have? And nuclear power, as I hinted at with that fuel source chart, is absolutely key in accomplishing this. Well, that gets to what you saw a sneak peek of. And what I'll, what I'll end with, these are a couple of charts that my friend Jason put together. This is based on World Bank data for, um, I think it's around 140 nations per chart. Each of these dots represents a nation. So see here you see the correlation of on the horizontal axis, electric power consumption in kilowatts per capita, which is the same measurement we were looking at in that chart of the United States. And on the vertical axis, you see life expectancy at birth in years. And what do you notice about the importance of the availability of electrical power? Now here you see the correlation of electrical power with mortality of people under five years old per 1,000 births and how dramatically it drops with the availability of electricity. And then finally, similarly, you see electricity correlated with the um, prevalence of undernourishment, something which we are facing in, in biblical proportions in parts of the world today. So anyway, I wanna end there. It really is this this issue of energy flux density of physical economics and of the centrality of every, the the, the role, the potential of every creative human being. Um, This this really is a moral question. It's the secret to economics, but I think it also gives us an insight into the great good we can be accomplishing if we can overturn this backwardness. 
Great. Thanks very much. And I do want to say we're going to have time to discuss all of these things amongst ourselves. I understand Mark is still battling traffic and tends to get on. So what I think I'd like you to do, Jose, is show a little bit and then Nick may have something to say and then we'll see if Mark is here and we'll go to Bruce otherwise. But uh, if you could show those pictures from Illinois and Nick may want to say something about what's going on there in the fight with the nuclear power plants. This is from the Capitol. What you're seeing here is a rally outside the state capitol where the legislature is in session now until I believe they adjourn on Monday for the spring session. So these people here, a lot of them are uh, nuclear plant workers and their families, some uh, union tradesmen and others who are supporting um, the keeping uh, open of the nuclear plants that are scheduled to uh, close down later this year, like they did in New York at the Indian Point nuclear plant. So this is important because it is a political fight. Um, I happened to um, reach out to my state legislator uh, yesterday morning. I've, I've spoken with his office uh, a few times over the course of uh, the past few months. And I actually spoke directly with him, not a staff person. And uh, we talked about uh, what was going on in the state legislature. There's a couple of uh, bills being proposed uh, that are trying to uh, create subsidies for the nuclear plants that would go to the Exelon Energy, which owns Commonwealth Edison, which owns uh, the two nuclear plants, uh, the subsidies that were put out of, in a report that the governor uh, commissioned earlier this year um, didn't reach the amount of money that the power company said they needed to keep them open. So there is a big argument about that. And then half of the report that was given to the governor and the state legislators and the news media was redacted back and forth. It was hard to read anything. At least that was a complaint of the legislators in, in the state capitol. Uh, besides that, the um, other problem that they're having here in Illinois is corruption. And uh, Mike Madigan, who is the longest serving uh, speaker of a, any state legislator in American history uh, resigned earlier this year as the, oh, well, I think it was the federal, uh, federal prosecuting the district in Northern Illinois outside of Chicago. Uh, they began indicting all of the speakers, uh, key people around them. And just yesterday uh, they indicted his uh, chief of staff. So as everyone, I, I shouldn't say as everyone, but as many people know how the political system works, when they target you, they line up uh, the big boys and they pull out all the barrels. So this just didn't happen to hit the news yesterday. They were working on it in a timed effort to, like Herschel says, give people the wrong idea about what's actually going on. And people don't understand that by closing down these nuclear plants that actually were given a 20 year uh, license renewal recently, one could operate safely for another 20 years. And the other one, I think uh, their license was renewed two or three years ago. So it still had another 17 years to go. Um, here in Illinois, that's kind of the situation we've got now as, as the uh, Stephen Reich the uh, legislator that I spoke to yesterday, he said that they at this time, late in the game, still don't have a bill in front of them in the legislature. It's still in committee and they're still fighting out this. And like what Herschel said was interesting, same thing going on here is that the governor wanted to meet uh, some ridiculously carbon-free goals by a certain date, which was 
would be totally impossible without keeping the nuclear plants operating. And uh, so he's, he's kind of, uh, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say he's tr trying to backtrack, but you know, he's trying to please everybody. And we all know you won't please anybody when that happens. But here in Illinois, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, and like I said to the uh, legislator uh, yesterday morning, I said, well, typically, um, if they don't get it done by the end of the session, they'll go into overtime. And the taxpayers will pay all the legislators to stay there until they hammer out all the legislation. And he said, kind of tongue in cheek, please don't say that. I want to go home. So uh, I'm an optimist like uh, Herschel, although it can be a pretty bleak outlook if you uh, look at things and you, you realize like uh, the, the information that Megan just gave us. Uh, so many people don't really understand the dynamics of what's going on. They only listen to the people who spoon feed them information and they say, well, we got to close a nuclear plant. You know, we're better off not having that and those kinds of things. So that's what I've got to, you know, report here from Illinois. I'm hoping uh, that by Monday they come through with some sort of a subsidy to keep these nuclear plants going. Otherwise we'll end up like New York. They'll be pumping, uh, the carbon into the atmosphere from the gas fired uh, plants. And um, that's something that these people don't want. Uh, and it's really kind of a issue that doesn't make any sense because uh, uh, the carbon emissions are, you know, not really the only cause of uh, climate change. Well, I'll Luckily, we don't have any corruption in New York, so that's certainly not the situation here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's almost <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and before I go to Bruce, I just want to say that I think um, uh, that people have been actually much too generous with the characters who are moving to shut down this power. And I think the key is the charts that Megan showed at the end, because the, the issue is, and, and I am one of these people, and maybe we'll argue about, it, I don't think that carbon dioxide is causing, I don't think human activity is significant enough to cause the temperature to change. We certainly do cause pollution. I'm not going to argue that, you know, and frankly, solar panels and windmills, because they are so horribly inefficient, and made with all kinds of fiberglass and chemicals and this and that and don't biodegrade and have to be buried in these big, you know, landfills uh, that they are actually much more damaging even than some fossil fuels. But the point is, if you depend on a resource which doesn't give you the magnitude of energy, energy flux density, you saw the charts uh, that nuclear supplied, you need to to increase your consumption, you need to use more and more and more energy. And then you start having to do things that I think are very damaging, like fracking. For example, we are trying to get oil or natural gas from sources where it's not as efficient to get it. And you are jeopardizing the environment in that way. And you're also creating an increased expense, which makes improving the standard of living untenable. And what happens when you do that is you create conditions, Helga used this term, potential relative population density. You create conditions where the earth cannot sustain the population that it has. And that means that, and, and when you hit a boundary condition or a threshold, you don't get like a just gradual, oh, uh, we can't sustain 1,200 people per square mile anymore. We can only sustain 1,100. So people die off gradually. That's not what happens. You get maybe a blackout for a week or two and everybody's food goes bad. And then you have all kinds of illness and the people who depended on insulin to be cold die. In other words, you get, you get leaps or um, non-linear 
hyperbolic kinds of collapse. And I think you're seeing that now in India where it's not just the pandemic, but now they're getting new kinds of diseases like some awful thing called black fungus and new, where it's just kind of an imploding situation, which is why this is really so life and death. And, and you see the total fraud of the people who called themselves environmentalists, which clearly if they're celebrating the shutdown of Indian Point, they were much more interested in making money. I mean, there was some kind of financial deal or some kind of payoff or something or other going on, which they were celebrating because it certainly wasn't having cleaner air or anything like that. So I'll just stop. I think Bruce may have some things to say and I'm sure, um, uh, both of you have, all of you have things to say. So Bruce, why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, just for background, um, I worked uh, as a millwright with the uh, United Brotherhood of Carpenters in a local in New Jersey. Um, and I had a chance to work on a lot of different types of machinery, uh, plants, and particularly in the energy sector both gas-fired plants, coal-fired plants, and nuclear plants. I worked in all of the nuclear plants in New Jersey, uh, one of which I lived about a mile from, which was Oyster Creek. And I used to regularly go there to do the maintenance functions when they would do the shutdowns. Um, and I also worked out at the Three Mile Island uh, unit. Um, a lot of people don't realize it's a kind of a similar circumstance in New Jersey to what was already referenced about the potential of the shutdown of nuclear power. In fact, uh, they Public Service Electric had threatened to shut all three now existing nuclear plants if they didn't get subsidies. Now that would have meant 60% of the energy production capability in New Jersey would have been immediately shut down. You know, it was bad enough they shut down Oyster Creek, which had actually just gotten a uh, major refurbishing and had gotten an okay from uh, the Atomic Energy Commission to function for another 20 years, but they were forced to shut down. Um, and the, uh, the similar kind of thing could have happened with um, the public service plants, 60% energy drop. I mean, think about that. I don't care if it's summer, winter, whenever, that would have been catastrophic. So they, you know, the legislature in New Jersey passed the necessary uh, legislation to allow the subsidies. Um, just as some background, New Jersey has uh, uh, been a full, uh, previously been a focal point for development of energy. Uh, there was a lot of work in a lot of the universities uh, on, on nuclear power. There was also the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, which, you know, at one time, it's, it's actually their, re, their uh, test facility is shut down right now. Um, but at one time, uh, it was thought back in the 60s that they would create a fusion city in New Jersey, similar to uh, Los Alamos or Oak Ridge. And that never came to fruition, but they actually planned on building a research city, which would have been dedicated to the development of fusion energy. Um, so New Jersey has a huge history in, in uh, energy and in advanced uh, research development. And that's, you know, uh, in a lot of ways has gone away. And you can also see that in the collapse of energy use in the state and the, and the disappearing of a lot of industries. Um, going back to the nuclear aspect, it takes, it, it took years and years for me to learn the ins and outs of individual nuclear plants, because they're, they're not uh, cookie cutter situations. They're very much different individually, and that's true across the country. It was very little of 
standardization within the nuclear industry over the years, unfortunately. Um, but for the people that worked in the plants, I mean, these were it, these uh, people took decades to actually develop the skill sets needed to maintain the plants and within the building trades like myself with the millwrights or the electrical, uh, the electricians, pipe fitters, steam fitters, metal workers, you name it. They all had to learn whole different skill sets to be able to to work in the in the industry. And with the shutting down of plants like Indian Point or Oyster Creek, you're losing that capability, which we we can't afford to. We really can't because it takes so long to rebuild it up. Um, and the, uh, the other thing, as far as the nuclear industry, we have very little as far as uh, capability to even build nuclear plants right now, whether it's transformers, whether it's uh, heavy castings, a lot of different things. We just don't manufacture it anymore. We rely on other countries to do that. So that there's a whole shift that needs to be accomplished if we're gonna be able to take that little slice as uh, Megan had pointed out on nuclear energy and actually up, upshift that to where we should have gone. You know, in fact, uh, there was a, uh, an estimation that we should have had at least 250 nuclear power plants in the country by now. And instead, we're in the process of shutting down, I believe it's, we're at less than 100 now. So uh, it, it's a, it really is a dire situation, which has to be reversed. And we have to get it across to as many people as we can, what Megan had pointed out around the use of energy consumption. So I, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm sure there's people that have questions. Great. I'd definitely like to. Herschel has some things to say. And before you go, Herschel, I should say there's someone cheering for you in the YouTube chat. Very happy about your presentation <laughs> and wants to know how much uh, fossil fuels we're using because they shut down Shoreham. But why don't you go ahead? I, I wanted to add to uh, Megan's statement, uh, a little different angle at it. Um, when you have a very low uh, energy uh, flux, like solar energy, for example, or wind, uh, in order to produce a given amount of energy, you have to have a larger collection area. Uh, when you have a larger collection area, like a huge solar farm, for example, um, you cannot economically protect that uh, area uh, against the vagaries of the climate. Uh, so here you have an interesting uh, contrast. I can protect a nuclear plant against a uh, category five hurricane. As a matter of fact, that happened. The uh, Andrew uh, uh, hurricane that hit Florida, uh, hit Turkey Point, nothing happened. However, if I were to, uh, and I've asked people in the offshore uh, wind system, what category uh, hurricane can you withstand? And they say a category three. Really? Well, what if a category four or five hits you? As a matter of fact, uh, the in, uh, information we're getting is that the frequency and intensity of these uh, hurricanes may be getting worse. Uh, and the answer I got was really bizarre. Oh, don't worry, we're insured. Well, frankly, as a consumer or as a society, that doesn't cut it. I cannot uh, cover a, a whole field of solar panels, even against uh, hailstorms. A colleague of mine who is uh, a professor at Cornell has told me that every time it snows, the solar panels have zero output. Now, this is not particularly threatening, but if I have a huge amount of my energy coming from solar panels and it snows, what am I supposed to do? Hire thousands of people to shovel the snow off? 
So one of the aspects of the very low uh, energy density compared to the nuclear, which is so compact, I can build, harden a nuclear plant. I cannot harden too much a renewable energy facility, which is so spread out. The economics forbid it. I think that's really important. You know, it, it what you're describing, well, a couple things to say about it. One is that I think just due to lack of education and, and other causes, people tend to think that, well, I turn on my light switch and what does it matter if my electricity comes from here or there? But they're qualitatively different. And you just described one important feature of it. Yeah. Um, the, the other aspect of it, I think, is um, kind of the, what you're describing. I hadn't thought of it that way, being able to ensure, protect this compact nuclear plant against you know, outside forces and so forth, as opposed to the solar plant, it really does mirror a process of evolution in the biosphere, which was described by the, the Russian scientist Bernatsky and other people um, about the evolution of life out of the oceans onto land, where, where over time life has become much more enclosed and much more self-determining. And you see that in the evolution of, of the human species as well. We've become more and more independent, not in a sense, I'll put it this way, independent of our environment, but more and more being able to shape our environment by wielding these principles. I mean, like going from being a snake. Yeah. Heat up by lying on a rock or right. a mammal. Or like a or like a jellyfish or some sea creature where you depend on the fluids which pass, you know, which you float through in the ocean and so forth. But when life moved onto land, in a sense, it took that fluid, those oceans with it, enclosing it in its body, being able to then um, ambulate on land and walk around. And then you have the higher forms of life like mammals, which can regulate their own temperature and so forth. Yeah. But going back to something else you said about uh, energy density, uh, I, I can bring up examples that long precede uh, the laser examples. I know I've seen places uh, quite old, uh, factories in Europe that were 500 or more years old, and they were uh, an advance in their time because they were belt driven off of hydropower. They were able to do a lot more than the individual craftsperson. And then along came the electricity and you had the control of a uh, drill press, which was very concentrated relative to the old uh, belt and pulley type arrangement. And once again, the productivity went up. So you, you are quite correct. The ability to control things or, or, or protect things at a very small volume uh, has enormous uh, implications for productivity. I was going to say also that really is the refutation of Thomas Malthus, who said that population grows geometrically, resources only increase arithmetically. Because what you're seeing by these examples, particularly how much fuel it takes, for example, to generate X amount of energy, that when a human being makes a discovery, and I would say there's two two aspects to this. One is having the human beings who make the discovery. Two, you have to have a society which is not a bunch of barbarians, which is actually willing to assimilate the discovery into raising that population to a new platform. And when you do that, what you discover is that your resources also increase geometrically. In fact, you can get a situation I mean, if you just look at the forms of energy, the amount of energy you're getting per ton has increased by orders of magnitude. In fact, even faster than your population has grown. Um, but that also gets to the inverse. It, you know, there are these processes, I guess, Pasteur and other people who worked on the question of chirality and directionality and some things can be reversed and some things cannot be reversed. You can't, once you've raised humanity to a certain platform of energy consumption and dependency on a certain 
like in the United States, we depend on having power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you suddenly don't have that, as I said before, you don't gradually decline. I just want to keep repeating this because I don't think people understand how devastating it will be. I don't know what's going to happen to New York City this summer when the temperatures are 98 degrees or whatever happens. You know, people are very upset about what happened to senior citizens in nursing homes, but what's going to happen to senior citizens who live on the 25th floor of a building that has no air conditioning and the elevator breaks down? Yeah. Well, we have another example here in New York uh, called the polar vortex, which very much hurt Texas. But if you go back historically about to the last major polar vortex in New York City, uh, New York was able to get through the polar vortex because the Indian Point plants were operating. The, uh, they don't have to worry about the coal freezing up on the coal uh, piles to feed a coal plant. Uh, and so forth and so on. But with the closure of Indian Point, what the uh, Public Service Commission has done is to uh, tell all the utilities, and we have many dual use electric plants in New York. They can run off of gas or run off of oil. Uh, we have a problem though. Uh, the buildup of gas heating in New York State, particularly around New York City, has been tremendous. So now comes a cold snap or a polar vortex. Should I put the coal, uh, gas into space heating or let people freeze? Or should I put it into the electric power plants? But I need the electric power plants to do this and this. So the way New York City is now solving that problem, and I have uh, reports on this, uh, the utilities are told stock up on oil. In other words, what we'll do is we'll use the gas for space heating preferentially, and those plants that can run off of oil, you run off of oil. Unfortunately, a lot of those dual plants are in environmental justice area. So you're gonna take a big whack on uh, your air pollution during a, a next polar vortex, because a lot of these plants may be burning oil. But New York City has been working for years to get out of the oil uh, electricity generation business. Not anymore. Can't do it. So there's a lot of very peculiar things that haven't been tracked down with regard to the closure of Indian Point. They're all anti-environmental things. Right. They're all anti-environmental justice things. If you look at upstate New York, what's happening there, the number of uh, locations where you want to have uh, wind farms and solar farms is huge and so much so that they're going to be changing the whole nature of upstate New York. They're going to industrialize upstate New York to have uh, solar panels, which incidentally in New York State, the capacity factor is only 14 percent. Nuclear is well over 90. So we well, don't get much snow in upstate New York, right? No, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the uh, implementation of these ideas is huge. Uh, there have been recent reports uh, done on studying uh, California, uh, whether or not California could be 100% uh, renewable. Uh, what you find is that if you do that, the price of electricity is so high that people who are economically disadvantaged are clobbered. So it's an environmental uh, economic justice issue. If you can't keep the price of electricity down, but I'll be darned if I've ever seen a state mandate that says something more than 100% renewable. Why don't they say uh, uh, least cost? That is a very important uh, economic issue, maybe more so than being 100% renewable. In fact, a single mandate doesn't in any way capture the complexity of how a society works. It's a right. mistake in and of itself. When you get, I want you to say something about what we can do about Indian Point because you know I did have a guest on who talked about the nuclear power plants in Canada that they got reopened, which had been shut down for seven years. And I understand there's a certain decommissioning process 
risk. So could you say something about that? Is it hopeless right now or can we do something about this? Uh, what happened in Shoreham is instructive because uh, they shut that down and the people there who got hold of it quickly drilled a hole in the reactor vessel. And when they did that, you can't start the plant up. No, that just seems satanic. I'm sorry, you do that much work on something and you just, oh, it really- It sickens you. Okay, it's now if you, uh, unless you maintain the uh, nuclear plant in a certain condition, mostly taking care of the water chemistry and a few other things, you can keep these plants around for years and years and years. But if your goal is to get in there and begin to cut it up, it's gone. And I'm afraid we're in the latter situation. Once the uh, Holtec company is on the site, which will be very soon, they, I'm fairly certain they will render it impossible to ever be restarted. So even if the governor had an enormous change of mind, says, no, we, we need these plants, too bad you killed them. Mm. Is there any recourse at this point? Can anyone stop this decommissioning? How would that happen? Well, uh, it's not happening by the Public Service Commission, they approved. It's not happening by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they approved. It's not happening by the governor or anybody else. It's not being stopped by FERC. So I don't know of anybody who has the clout to say, wait a minute, nobody's saying that, nobody. As a matter of fact, uh, I did a special study on Indian Point and on the decommissioning. And I find that there's probably close to a billion dollars worth of overcharges. Public Service Commission didn't do that. I sent them to document, nothing. So the situation is more than the loss of Indian Point. It's the loss of good governance. It's the loss of confidence that your leaders are working for you. And that to me is even much more scary than the loss of a particular pair of nuclear plants. That's what's going on. People are losing, I still know myself, I've lost a lot of confidence in our both state and federal governments to do what's in the best interest of people like my grandchildren. Sorry. No, unfortunately there's good reason for that. Well, Bruce and Nick, do you have any thoughts on what's come up here? Well, yeah, a couple of comments. Uh, Megan had that chart where she showed how many uh, tons of wood it would take and tons of oil uh, that would it would take to keep New York City uh, electrified for a year. Uh, that triggered in my mind a, uh, uh, a an, an excerpt from a biography of Albert Einstein by Walter Isaacson. It's a great book if you ever get a chance to read it. But in that book, he said, let's take Einstein's famous, uh, what is that, theory? Or famous uh, e equals mc squared. Uh, he says, let's just take uh, uh, the velocity of light and square that. It's just a huge number. Multiply that by the mass, another huge number. You can't even think. He said, if you were able to take the amount of energy in a raisin, you'll be able to keep New York electrified for one day, Yeah, which was a pretty amazing thing. And the other thing that triggered my mind when you said, what would people do if they didn't have electricity to keep things cool? I was in... Portland, Oregon recently. And in downtown Oregon, I think they, they claim it's the world's largest bookstore. It's one city block. It's like five stories tall. You go in there and it's overwhelmed in the amount of books. But the book that jumped off the page at me was called Chilled. And the book started off and he said that uh, there is a, uh, what did he call it here? The cold chain with its myriad nodes and branches entangles the globe, creating a temperature controlled transport corridor that connects the farmer's field and the trawler's hold to every grocery store chiller. 
And he goes through, I haven't read the whole book, but it was just interesting when he talked about man has, uh, what he said, man has begun to, uh, for a couple of millennia now, control heat and light, but only in the last 150 years has he been able to begin to control cold. And he, it's a very interesting book and it's all the dynamics of energies. How, how do we understand energy? How can we use it for our own purpose? And like Herschel says, it's a little disappointing that the leadership in our local governments and our federal governments and that uh, really are not doing the things needed to keep uh, the populations from collapsing when they do stuff like shut down Indian Point or yeah. threaten to close down the nuclear plants here or give monies away to these uh somebody on one of your symposiums uh said they're not renewables they're unreliables i forget which one of your guests said right. that, but he was <laughs> absolutely right i think that was john rose <laughs> yeah exactly i mean i just someone asked here and i want to respond about uh at this point should we send messages to preserve indian point to go to biden the doe and the epa one thing I think we should do is ask every single person running for mayor of New York City what they're going to do when they don't have electricity. Because frankly, the state, the um, our guest from Canada had said, you know, why doesn't the, I mean, I guess we could tell the DOAE to buy the plant or the state to buy the plant or the city to buy it. You know, I forget if it was de Blasio or Cuomo, someone had this harebrained scheme that we were gonna get hydroelectricity from Canada and bring it. I mean, how many zillions of dollars would that cost where the city could just buy the plant and reopen it if they thought it was important to have electricity? Uh, and I do think this is right. One of the things that came up from the nuclear New York is exactly what you were saying, Herschel, about some of the areas in these poorer communities, the Bronx, Brooklyn, I don't where, know where these all gas-fired power plants are, but they're old, they're not super efficient, which means they are putting things in the air that you wouldn't want to be breathing, and they're going to be bearing the brunt of this if we have power at all. Or maybe their plan is just to send everyone out of New York and no one will ever live there again, I don't know. Send them to New, to New Jersey and Bruce can take care of them. <laughs> no, you're not going to run out of electricity in New York when Indian Point is closed. That was the purpose of building the two gas plants, the CPV plant, which I believe is not even properly licensed, but allowed to run, and also the uh, Cricket Valley plant and other plants. Right. So the, the thing you have to investigate uh, is the fact that why was it when uh, three men in a room got together, namely the, the governor, river keeper, and uh, energy on a secret meeting, and they agreed to shut down Indian Point, but they didn't do it immediately. Why didn't they shut them down immediately if there was such a big hazard? Well, uh, this this kind of a question came up. Uh, the governor made his announcement about Indian Point on January 9th, 2017. About a month and a, or so later, there was a combined meeting of the New York Assembly and Senate. And one of the legislators asked uh, the energy czar, Richard Kaufman, uh, how, uh, you know, what set the date for the closure of these two nuclear plants? Because they were years away from closure. If they're so dangerous, why aren't you closing them now? Uh, Kaufman's answer, and it's all a matter of record, well, we're being very generous. We're gonna allow the local group, which we just uh, sideswiped, to uh, have years to recover. What he didn't tell the legislature is that they needed the time to build the two gas plants. Now that's what's really going on in New York. You're not gonna have an immediate shortage. What you're gonna have is, a lot more gas being burned, a lot more pe people exposed to air pollution, uh, a lot more health issues. Uh, and then, you know, and they, we have people now around Newburgh, New York, complaining about the uh, 
ex expansion of the Donskammer plant up there, to run more gas. And the excuses mm -hmm. they're getting back, I assume from the state, well, we need Donskammer to uh, offset the sh closure of Indian Point. So they're admitting that we need gas to replace Indian Point. And then later on, uh, other people from the state, and I've written this up, are saying, oh no, Indian Point was replaced by renewable energy, energy f efficiency, an out and out lie. So, hey, they're, re they're refuting the data that comes out of the New York State independent uh, power producer, uh, NISO, independent system operator rather, the data are there. The data show that when Indian Point closed, it was replaced by gas. And other state officials are saying incorrectly, oh no, it was replaced by renewable energy and energy efficiency. Not true. What kind of a person tells the public a lie that is so easily disproved? And I sit back and I say, this is crazy. I'm, I'm worried. Am I going to trust this person to protect my children and grandchildren? Never. Right. Exactly. Now what? So uh, there's a lot of angry people there. And it's a lot more. You look at the fishermen off of Long Island. They're not right. happy with what's going on with the offshore stuff. You look at the people upstate New York. They're not happy. You look at... Um, <clears throat> the thousand people who lost their job at Indian Point. Well, and you look at the record, the record shows that the increase in renewable energy in New York State is small compared to the increase in gas. Yet we have governors and others saying, gotta get away from this stuff. We're leaders on climate change and clean energy. The hypocrisy is huge. Uh, Herschel, the... Um gas plants you're talking about, are they the uh, combined cycle plants? Yes. Yeah. So they're, they're basically not a 24 hour a day operation. These plants, because I worked on a, b a bunch of these plants in New Jersey are primarily to, for peak load. No, that's uh, not peak load ones. They're the, their combined cycle plants are the more efficient than the, Old, older plants, hmm. but they're, they're running as much as their tech specs will allow. And so right. they're probably running 80% of the time and particularly in the high demand periods of the peak. Right, because they, they maximize the amount of money they make by doing that. Well, absolutely. Behind all this is, is money. Right, it's right. Money. The all other thing that you just pointed out also is that because of the way they operate, that the, there's a bigger potential for a tendency to break down because when you start and stop these plants, you're putting them through extreme temperature changes. Yes. And yes. you have a lot of problems with the turbines, the, uh, uh, well, the uh, uh, gas turbines breaking down. Uh, you ought to bring that up, Bruce, to the people in California. Mm -hmm. The people in California have this uh, so-called duck curve they have so much solar energy that in certain times of the day, it's more than they need. They have to almost dump it. But other times at the t end of the day, when the sun is going down, they can't keep up. Right. So, or if this, there are clouds that come over the solar panels, we have problems there. So the backup all the time in California is to burn gas. The gas plants right. are constantly running. It's sort of like a standby until they're needed to ramp up. And then they have to ramp up quite rapidly. Yeah. They ramp down. So now mm -hmm. we turn a variable energy source, the solar panels, and we turn the constant or nearly constant production of a gas plant, they've turned them into variable plants. So now we have variable solar and variable uh, gas plants. And, in, and the result is that California has blackouts. It has one of the uh, highest costs for electricity. And they're not really making much progress on greenhouse gases because they're always burning the gas. It's screwed up. Oh, and you have to ask yourself, well, didn't they have any engineers working in the Public Service Commission when they figured this out? It's, 
madness. Mm. It's, it's it's really like the old <laughs> tulip situation in Holland hundreds right. of years ago. Exactly. That collapsed. No, yep. that's they have that's they that's have that's more that's investors that's working than they do engineers. Yeah, but they don't produce anything except trouble. Don't they have something called an investing engineer now? No, I'm just kidding. But they have every other kind of engineer. Uh, I think we we need to wrap up soon, but I just want to see if Megan had anything else. That... Um, no, I think this has been really fun. I just think, again, just, I mean, both Herschel and Nick, and I know Bruce, you are, there's that issue of optimism. I think we, you have to keep this, um, fierce optimism for the potential of, of humankind. Um, I mean, that's why I think nuclear power and fusion power are just so fascinating and exciting. And I think just continuing this fight for the good of man, and you imagine people in countries, which right now are, are on the left side of those charts I showed with the infant mortality and so forth. Um, imagine these children who right now are dying under the age of five instead you know, getting to unlock new secrets of the nucleus, which we don't know yet. So yeah, anyway, I just think that's that's the kind of optimism and, and fight we just have to be determined to have in this kind of period. Hope you're right. Great, well, I would like to say, and I wish I don't have a copy of it here and I can't show it. I don't know if Jose can find it, but my campaign has revived a paper that was LaRouche's paper called The New Federalist. And it's named after Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Papers because the idea of Hamilton and Madison and John Jay was to actually unite our states so that we could stand strong against the British Empire, which didn't really leave after the American Revolution. And you had to have a, a system of economy. Oh, great. Someone brought me my copy. I, I think it's Oh yeah, that's not, is that backwards? No, you can read it. That's the front of it. And the back article right here, can you see that? Ooh, yeah. There we go, yeah. Reopen Indian Point or spend big bucks for blackout. Um, and it's gonna be coming out every month and you can go on sareforsenate.com and sign up to get extra copies of the newspaper and get them out, which we need to do. Oh. Yes, here it is. There it is. The new Federalist on the Sarah for Senate. Jose has it. Yeah. And it's really in black and white, but we thought we'd make it pretty on the web and put color pictures in there um, so we can circulate it and get it out. Very important. I would like to build a distribution network in, in the state of New York that has the capacity to get out, I don't know, 100,000 copies in 24 hours we should really build a big machine in the state because I do not intend to sell my soul. So I'm not gonna have zillions of dollars like Chuck Schumer, but we'll have enough and we'll have real people. Uh, what I wanted to just say, this tulip bubble thing, I'm so glad you raised that because a friend of mine, a colleague of ours, Paul Gallagher, who writes economic reports just pointed out, here they are shutting down nuclear power plants and then you have this thing with colonial, and you mentioned it, Hirsch, in one of your letters, I think, colonial pipeline, which gets hacked. Now, here's the thing. The hackers didn't actually disrupt the, dis the functioning of the pipeline. They disrupted some of the financial ends of it, but they chose to shut down the distribution, which does raise a question. If you look at what happened just recently in Texas, where you had that company Gritty, which was price gouging, where people went from $131 electric bill to $9,000 and they, and, or more exactly. Or if you think about what Enron was doing, and, and this is where you really see the evil, a hatred, of humanity and this question of lack of trust where people say, I don't care who suffers or who. in fact, the more people who suffer and die, the more pleasure I get in having power over them and making money through their suffering. It is really sick. And we have a stock market bubble, as Helga said in her speech, Mrs. LaRouche said to the Russians, we have a 75% increase in money in circulation. So where is that money gonna go? You have to have other kinds of bubbles 
that you can pump it into. If you make energy scarce, well, the law of supply and demand, the old British free trade, never mind that we fought a revolution against it, uh, you can you know, buy cheap, sell dear. And, and this brings me to the last thing I'll say before we close is the urgent necessity of the four laws that LaRouche wrote in 2014, starting with the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, the separation of the banks. We should not be bailing out gambling debt and you have to have a solvent commercial banking system through which to issue credit to build the things we need. We have to get control over the cost of living so that an actual wage actually has a purchasing power, which means something in the standard of living. And this has to be done immediately. I mean, not in 2022. My campaign is not about all the wonderful things that I'm gonna promise people and we're gonna do them in 2023. We're gonna suffer greatly if we don't get them done now. So that's what I have to say. I want to thank all of you very, very much. I thank all of you for your fight, uh, Herschel, Nick, everyone who's in this fight to save these power plants, Bruce over the years running for office as well, uh, and Megan leading the Schiller Institute. We have a lot of work to do, and I would like to encourage everybody who's watching this to get active with my campaign in New York, sign up at sarahforsenate.com. And I will say tomorrow, Saturday at 2 p.m. on the laroucheorganization.com, we're gonna have a special Memorial Day program uh, talking about various leaders and presidents who had a vision. Really what we should think about on Memorial Day is how to get to a world where war is no longer a means of solving disputes. And if you want to avoid war, you have to have a reliable standard of living and people have to have governments that they trust. So thank you very, very much. And I think with that, we'll conclude this discussion.